Hello, welcome to the Bella Vista Gardening Program. I'm Jerry Harner and with me today is Fran Zimmerman. And Fran is a fellow member of the Bella Vista Garden Club. And today, um, oh, Fran also hosts some of the shows sometimes uh, yes. that you'll see in the future and have seen in the past. And the subject of today's show is plant this, not that. And in other words, we're talking about what type of plants you can um, plant for those that aren't um, behaving or, you know, are invasive and... Um, Make your life easier. Right. And uh, a lot of plants take a lot of care and maintenance, so we're going to be talking about plants you can use instead of those and have the same basic effect. So, and we'll also be talking about what we need to do in our garden in July. So, um, well, there aren't a lot of gardening activities going on in July, but you might like to take a time on a cool morning to go to Compton Gardens, walk the trails, uh, go to Crystal Bridges and also walk the trails. There always changes. Every few weeks right. the plants will be changing as um, just the weather changes, but also the horticulturalists are also always changing the plants. Yeah. And you can get some good ideas for what might work in your own yard. Then they have both have a lot of native plants that yes. you know, can, we can use uh, in our landscape also. And you mm -hmm. can see how they grow and how they you know, look at different times of the year. So True, they're concentrating on natives. Yes, they are. Uh, so some plants can be very invasive and require a lot of maintenance. And um, you can either spraying or trimming or, you know, taking a lot of time out of your life that you can't enjoy your garden. So uh, we have some suggestions that um, you can use different plants um, that look good in your garden and, and not mm -hmm. take a lot of work. So um, native plants usually require less water and um, they're, you know, usually maintenance free, some of them. And, um, and not all of them. Yeah, not them. all of them. And but sometimes they're you know not as hard to control. Right. Um, so we have a list of plant suggestions to replace some of the high um, maintenance plants that um, that you can use. So unlike um, the native honeysuckle is much much better than the Japanese honeysuckle. The Japanese honeysuckle is just about taken over acres and acres and acres of of land, you know, all over the country. Now you have the native honeysuckle, right? Uh, yes, I do. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And um, it has it's, yellow flower. It's the yellow flower, but um, just be careful when you you know buy it at the nursery. Make sure it's the native honeysuckle. And then um, the nine bark is a wonderful native um, bush that can replace the bush honeysuckle or the Chinese or European privet. Now the privet, they say, is so invasive, the green privet. Yes. Sure. It just comes up everywhere. And um, I have the variegated privet, which doesn't seem to be quite as invasive, but the nine bark is a wonderful plant uh, bush to replace those. And sometimes you can get a dark version, a dark right. purple version, or you can get the green, whatever there's suits. A green. And then there's one that has like a, um, an autumn, what they call it, autumn something right. in the nine bark. It right. has different um, purple and mm -hmm. and, uh, and maroon. Right. You know, it's but, really a pretty nine bark. But back to the list, a lot of people have Bradford pears. Oh yeah, and that's been way overplanted. Yes, and it's very invasive. So the Cleveland pear pear is a good alternative. It has the same beautiful flowers, and but it's not as prone to the damage that the Bradford, and it's, um, I think it's a sterile plant. I don't think it can produce all these, you know, invasive um, plants all around it, so. Now, have you seen many multiflora roses? Um, they, you see them basically out in the countryside. Mm -hmm. You'll see them on the lawn, on the, I mean, on the uh, farmer's uh, rose, you know, hedge okay. rose, and on their fences, and it's just, it's everywhere out in the country, you know. And some people, you know, get it, pull it out, and put it in their garden. And it's, it uh. can be, you know, really invasive. So your knockout and your drift roses are really a better alternative. They don't require, you know, spraying or care uh, like some of the hybrid teas or floribundas. But uh, the knockout and drift roses are a good alternative to that multiflora. So, and then um, for your wisteria, the Japanese or Chinese wisteria is so damaging to whatever you put on. Unless you put it on a metal pole, <laughs> it will take 
excuse me, take down whatever you put it on, where the American wisteria is, um, is not as um, damaging. That can go up on a trellis. You right. You can see mm -hmm. it on a trellis. Or, or, you know, I had a um, Japanese um, wisteria for years, like 15 or 18 years, and never did bloom. <laughs> but it grew like crazy, and every year I'd say, well, this year it's going to bloom. And um, it finally started destroying the, uh, the lattice work. Yeah. So we had to just take it down, and um, it's just not worth it. So anyway, and your liriope. Now, a lot of people have liriope, yes. and there's two f different types. Now, your liriope muscari is the clumping farm. It just farms clumps, but the liriope spicata sends runners, and it can just be showing up anywhere, you know, within yes. a 10-foot area of where you planted it. And it's, it's pretty invasive, and it's really hard to control, because once you have one little root in there, oh, yes. you can't get oh, it out. Yes, yeah. and just for our listeners or viewers, um, sometimes this is called monkey grass. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think every garden that I have toured for the Master Gardeners um, Gardens or any garden tour, I have seen liriope in almost every garden. It's a wonderful plant and it's a great border plant or just a little just accent plant. Clump. It's a wonderful plant to use, but just be sure you've got the, the liriope muscari. Yes. Yeah. Now the Hotania or chameleon plant, I don't know if you have that. No. Well, it's like a ground cover and it's, um, it's a multicolored leaf. It's a pretty leaf, but it can be so invasive. I'm fighting it in my garden, really. Oh, really? Yes, I am. Come Unfortunately, I put it in an area where it's not confined. Uh. If you have a confined area where it can't get out, uh, it's fine. But then I think still the seeds, uh, the birds still uh, drop some of the seeds in other places. I see right. it come up. So we're but recommending barren wart. Barren wart is a, a great little ground cover, and it blooms yellow in the spring. Mm -hmm. It's a native plant, and it's um, it's just a nice little ground cover, and it spreads, but it's not that hard to control if it gets a little out of bounds. So, mm -hmm. um, and the creeping jenny. Now, I have the creeping jenny, the light green, or like chartreuse creeping jenny, is much easier to control than the the green, mm. the darker green. That can just kind of go everywhere. So, and then English ivy. Um, is another invasive that's really hard to control. Grow up trees and Kills you know, them. just go everywhere. So the barren strawberry for shade are the squawweed for the part shade. Our sand phlox is uh, sun to part shade. These are all ground covers that will give you some color, some you know blooms, and and not mm -hmm. be so hard to control. Mm -hmm. So now, do you have any of those? Um, I have the all three, three of those. The barren strawberry is great for also, um, it crowds out the weeds, mm -hmm. and it's, it's a wonderful plant. It has yeah. a little yellow flower in the spring. Mm -hmm. And then the vinca, um, vinca major is the one that is really, really hard to control. Yes. And vinca that, minor is not as hard. It's the vinca minor has that sort of purpley blue flower. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the vinca major has the blue flower too, but um, it's uh, it's not you know, quite as invasive, the vinca, the vinca minor, it's easier. Okay, then the burning bush. Um, the burning bush is, is listed as an invasive plant. Apparently, the, you know, pops up here and there in the, in yeah. the, in the wild. And um, we have the little uh, sweet spire, little Henry or yes. Henry's garnet. Right. And that has the white flowers in the spring. And then in the fall, it has beautiful color, just like the burning bush. So that's a good alternative. So those are the things that you can plant. Um, and tell them you know, about our website, too. Oh, yeah. I'll have, I'm going to put some of these on our website, um, uh, bellavistagardenclub.com, under the gardening information. Mm -hmm. And then there's some other um, suggestions I've gotten from uh, seminars in the past. And uh, we can uh, list those. They have alternatives right. for uh, things that are harder to control. Yes, so, that's great. Um, anyway, we want to um, give you some tips for the gardening, um, uh, for gardening that Wait. may make life a little easier. But before that, I just oh. want to talk about the oh. invasive plants to avoid, which oh, include yeah. bamboo. Mm -hmm. um, there are some better bamboos and some 
not so good bamboos. If you do grow bamboo, and we are doing it, um, we go out and check it frequently. Uh, the so you can you talk can about the spider flower, Jerry. You okay, know this Cleome. Uh, you see a lot of people with Cleome. It has a uh, tall um, stalk, and then the flowers on top with little wispy things coming out. You know, yes, it's a pretty little flower. But every one of those seeds probably germinate, so you'll have them everywhere. And um, I mean, if you want an area where it just can go and, and bloom and, and take over, right. that's fine. But just be careful of that. It's, it's called an invasive plant. And then, of course, you, everybody knows mint is invasive. Yes. <laughs> I found that out years ago. So yeah. I grow my mint in pots. I keep yes. it in pots because it'll, it'll take over the world, I think, if you yes. let it. So. And then the gooseneck loose strife, uh, the, of course, the purple uh, gooseneck is illegal to even sell or purchase. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, a lot of that was up north, um, right. I think, that started. But the white gooseneck is still available, and it can be hard to control. Right. Because it sends the runners, and I'm fighting a bit of it right now myself. So um, I'm going to have to just cut it back and put some black plastic over that area. Yes. Because it's. Um, it's taken over a little more than it needs to take over. So, uh, and your winter creeper, I don't have that, and I'm not familiar with uh, winter creeper, but I think it's also listed as invasive. You know, it just mm -hmm. kind of gets out of bounds and goes everywhere. So, and then there's bishop's weed, or what we call snow in the mountain. Yes, it's interesting because snow in the mountain is, people say, oh, isn't that nice underneath that that tree yeah, and cover. it's a it's a variegated little leaf it's it's low but that really is bishop's weed right snow on the mountain is variegated but it's a taller plant however we here call bishop's weed snow on the mountain yes we do one every the, region has a, yes. you know, different names for different plants but, but we call it snow on the mountain one of the most difficult things about growing bishop's weed which it can be okay but it's it's preventing it from spreading because its rhizomes are thin and brittle, and if you even try to pull out a plant, the the what's left, the little thin brittle rhizomes, propagate themselves and build even more plants. It's like you multiply the <laughs> problem you're trying to remove. Um, <clears throat> so the idea is to plant them first with an edging that really goes down into the ground. Right. Either that, or if you haven't done that. Just use an herbicide and get rid of it. Yeah, or put it in a pot. <laughs> grow it in a pot. Yeah, grow know, it in a, a pot. A little uh, accent to a, um, a planted pot, but you just have to control it. Right. And um, but besides invasive plants to avoid, we can also garden smarter too mm -hmm. and make life a little easier for ourselves. No matter where you are in life, you could be. Um, at, you know, retired and wanting to travel more, or you could be raising a young family and having lots of things to do with that. But if your life doesn't include chasing after um, runaway plants, <laughs> yeah. then we have some tips for you. Yeah. So you got to look for annuals that um, that don't require the deadheading, because the impatience, um, you know, don't require deadheading with and lantana. So right. kind of look for those those annuals that you don't have to keep tending, you know, keep, keep deadheading so they'll keep blooming. So that Million Bells. Million mentioned. Bells is another one uh, that doesn't need deadheading. And, and for native grasses, choose a clumping grass such as prairie drop seed or oak sedge. They're a real pretty little clumping grass mm -hmm. and they, they will behave themselves. Or if you want a mid-sized grass, little blue stem. Um, is uh, a great one. It stays yeah. put and it doesn't spread. And I would personally suggest getting a slight cultivar of a little blue stem that stands up straight in the fall and doesn't mm -hmm. flop over. Yeah, because the maiden grass has been planted so much, but it just gets it grows and grows and grows and grows. And pretty soon you try to get it out and you can't. You need a backhoe to get it out. Yes. So um, the smaller native grasses are, are easier. And then um, uh, native prairie perennials, they grow in poor soil and um, you planted black-eyed Susans which is um, a native and but unfortunately I had built up the soil a bit with just regular Arkansas to topsoil mm -hmm. with compost added well these few little cuttings uh, ended up really liking that soil <laughs> taking over it needs deadheading it was someone walked in 
to our yard and said, oh, it looks so beautiful and lush. I went, well, you don't know. <laughs> what so it, they're gone. What they're it gone. takes to do that, because it can be. Um, they're, they are gone. If they like what they, where they are, they can really spread. So, but woody plants uh, really take uh, less maintenance yes. than, um, than perennials that aren't, you know, the woody stems. So. Right. As a matter of fact, we are, we've pulled out those um, black-eyed Susans and are this fall going to put in more shrubs. We mm -hmm. have a few shrubs in there and mm -hmm. we're going to put appropriate. But if you put the black-eyed Susans like at a, a, on the edge of the, of, the, um, of the lot, you know, where it doesn't get a lot of sun. Yes. You know, some will then, have some sun, then it, it's easier they are to control. Good. They are good. And good they color. will attract the butterflies, mm -hmm. and, and they're a good plant. Right. They just so it's finding the right plant in the right place, yes. too. And then, um, so you need to also have ground covers that can discourage weeds, and um, you just have a, a nice covering on your gra on your um, your beds. And coral bells or um, hucheras, that's um, a good one. And I have quite a few of the coral bells, and they mm -hmm. just kind of, you know, fill the whole area, and it's really, really nice to, to use. And they slowly grow, and you can divide mm -hmm. them and make more. Right. And the barren strawberry, you have that in part shade. Mm -hmm. And then also try your, um, your yellow or orange butterfly weed. Uh, they're the more clumping, or one of the more clumping grasses. So the butterfly weed will grow a little bit, um, but they're great for butterflies. You know, the butterflies love them, and the bees. Now here's so. the next thing. We've been talking about invasive plants, but even if a plant is not listed as invasive, if it is more than you can handle, if it spreads and is more work than you'd like to put into it or have time to put into mm -hmm. it, then maybe it's time to switch it out for something else um, that minds its manners. Uh, ones, uh, even if for temporarily that thing is mulch that you're switching it out for, but uh, one plant that comes to mind that is a perfectly nice plant, but it tends to spread, is the primrose. Oh, yeah. And the yellow or the pink. Mm -hmm. It can be nice, but boy, they can just go. If they like where they are, they're going to really spread. And if yeah. your lifestyle doesn't allow you mm -hmm. to maintain, to it. maintain yeah. it, then mm -hmm. you then you need to. Another one is Italian arum, which... Uh, you also have to keep a, an eye on. Right. It's beautiful it, foliage, but... The foliage is beautiful, but uh, and it has like a peace lily bloom, but once it puts up that little stalk of, of red bee, uh, berries, yes. that's where the seeds are, and the birds take those seeds, and you'll find this plant, you know, different All parts over. of your garden. And if you fi I found one in my hosta, well, I had to move the hosta because you can't get this, this Italian arum out. It's got such a big taproot, so... Um, what I do is I take, when as soon as I see the seed pod starting to I've bloom, doing that. I just take it off and, and get rid of the seed pod so I don't have to deal with all these arums. But I do like the plant, and the leaves are wonderful for uh, flower arranging and, and things yeah. like that. They're a beautiful leaf. And but one last idea for making life simpler as you're gardening smarter is just yeah. think about your lifestyle. Any mm -hmm. physical limitations, um, any your your age, your priorities. Uh, for example, when I was raising my family, um, I limited myself to very uh, easy care shade gardening and a vegetable gardening because I wanted to teach the kids about raising vegetables. But it, we kept it simple, nothing nothing very complicated. I mean, the one night I found myself planting impatience by flashlight after putting my daughter to bed. That was it. Yeah. <laughs> that, that That's a did little it. too much. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think you have, uh, you were telling me a story about a garden well, tour you went on. I just went on a garden tour recently, and um, the woman started this garden in Rogers in a little, you know, uh, house uh, with just a neighborhood yard, you know, just a small yard. And she started when she was 70 years old. Well, she's now 81. And when I went through the garden, uh, I couldn't believe how many plants she had that we've discussed today that take so much maintenance to control. And I'm thinking, this poor woman just must be out there all the time, you know, controlling these plants. And to think she started it when she was 70. Right. That's a big undertaking Yes, she was 70 to start yes. this big garden. It was a beautiful garden. But, you know, this must be her life, and that must be all she does is just maintaining and, and controlling these plants. So, you know, just be careful when you start a garden 
that you know that it's um, it's going to be able to to be maintained and not take your entire life over. So, but it was well, really quite funny to see that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, now it's July. Yeah. What should people be doing in July? Okay. Well, you know, we've had a lot of rain, a lot of rain this uh, this year so far, and I haven't even put my watering system on of it maybe one time. Uh, but we got to be prepared for the drought. The drought's probably going to come, and we're just not going to, you know, have all this rain again. So you just have to water smart mm -hmm. and uh, conserve your water by using a drip system, our soaker hoses, and don't forget to turn them off. <laughs> you know, when you do turn them on. So that's been another issue. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> and um, but you want to water early in the morning or late in the evening and then water deeply, and um, but not too often. You want to just get a good um, soaking. And two to three inches of mulch really does help retain the water and keep the plants cooler in the heat of the summer. So the heat's going to be coming soon. You now, know, if you have annuals and herbs out there, uh, now's the time to keep deadheading them, and your herbs do need deadheading uh, yeah, so they don't go to seed. Right. And um, continue to uh, water before you fertilize so that you don't uh, harm the roots. Mm -hmm. Pinch back to keep your plants from growing tall and spindly. Mm -hmm. That's very, very true. Um, those petunias can get the best of you sometimes. Yeah, they get a little scraggly if you don't <laughs> pinch them back. Yes, and also if you can use your herb leaves to make some flavored oils and vinegars, mm -hmm. this is a good time. Are the basil leaves are wonderful for appetizers. You know, a little cracker yes. with a little cream cheese and then just put a little basil leaf on top. It's and a great appetizer. And that will be next in Jerry's cooking show. <laughs> oh, well, the perennials, you have to um, pinch back your mums till about June, uh, July 15th and then they'll have a nice uh, bloom in the fall. And uh, of course, deadhead all your flowering perennials too. And, and some of them will rebloom, you know, on your uh, perennials. And for your lawns, uh, they require a deep watering of at least one inch weekly. Mm -hmm. uh, hold back on fertilizer during July and August though. It's really important because that is when the heat strikes and you can damage, damage it. Mm -hmm. Raise your more blades also this month. All right. And for roses, you have just have to watch for your aphids and the fungus. If you see aphids, you can take your hose and on a real firm, firm spray, you know, like a jet spray, and spray them off. And, and if you do that a couple days in a row, you just probably won't have any more aphids for a while. And I haven't seen hardly any Japanese beetles again this year. Last no. year there were a few, but I haven't I seen haven't hardly seen any. any. Either. And I don't know if this is a sign that they're gone forever. I think it may just be. We're lucky. That's, for the that's last wishful couple thinking, years. I believe. They may be back in, you know, next year, but I haven't seen too many this year. So, um, now, uh, trees and shrubs we're going to attack together because right. <laughs> because it's multi uh, it's a multi problem thing. We want to check evergreens for bagworms, mm -hmm. but there's uh, and for scale as well. Right. But there's also another kind of worm that hangs in a net bag that can be confused with it, and that's called a webworm. Why right. don't you tell us the Well, the webworm will go into the, the branches, you know, the cricks of the branches, and you'll see a big, a big nest of, you know, like a spider web almost. And the only way to control them really is to just break that bag open in the morning. Just take some kind of tool or rake if you can reach it, you know, and just open the bag. And the wasps will come in that day and, and take care of the worms, you know. It'll be just taken care of. You don't have to cut that whole limb off or try to get that bag thing down. Mm -hmm. You know, just open it up. That's their protection. Once you open it, the wasps and, the, and other, you know, anim flying animal critters will get in there and take care well, of the worms. Well, that's good. That's a good natural way to, yeah. to take and it. And it's easy. But the bag worms... Bagworms are just like a little, they're like a little brown, rough bag hanging on yes. a, a plant. They're about this long, and they're just like a brown um, bag. You know, so they're not very rough, big? No, not real big. And do you clip off the... Well, you just pull them off your plant and put them in a metal bucket and either burn it, just burn the the, the put worms. Put a little... Uh, you put a little... Lighter fluid, lighter fluid in there or something. Or some people put them in a, a bucket of turpentine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you do want to kill the worms. You don't want to just take those and throw them in the trash. Right. You know, they'll come up somewhere else somewhere. Right. But um, just to kill them and, um, and just be watching because once you see those bags on that, 
that uh, evergreen. plant, that evergreen, they can defoliate it really quickly. Okay. And I so think there's also check. in the spring, if you see the actual worm, it's a really small little worm, if you see that and you spray that with uh, an insecticide, that'll, so that'll help. So after you've gotten your, your worms <laughs> off of your trees, you also have to water them. Right. And, Check them and for water. make sure that they're, and if you, especially if you planted them in the spring, mm -hmm. um, that's a really important time. Right. You've got to get them established with uh, a good watering system. And then your vegetables. Um, you should be harvesting your vegetables now. I have heard people complaining about the tomatoes, that they're not very big and they're not turning red. Well, we had so much rain and no sun. So my little um, cherry tomatoes are all like mottled, you know, the color is oh. all mottly. But it's that they had too much rain at one time and not enough sun. So I think once this rain has subsided a little bit, the, the production will be better. They'll That's be good. growing bigger and, and um, you'll have a better crop. So, but um, just be sure you get all your vegetables, you know, pick them at the, in the morning when they're in their peak, peak flavor and, and good. enjoy them. Good. So. Well, if you have any other questions about gardening in July, um, remember the Master Gardener Hotline is available on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 9 to 12, and then again from 1 to 4. Just call 271-1060 to speak to a Master Gardener. Also, their website is bentoncountygardening.org, and it's filled with gardening information. Yeah, that has a lot of information, that website. And then, like I said, if you want to talk to a master gardener, you can just call and, and talk to one. But if you want more information about the Bella Vista Garden Club, you can go to their website, and that's bellavistagardening.com, or bellavistagardenclub.com. And um, after taking a few months off uh, for the summer, the Garden Club will be meeting again in September. We meet on the fourth Wednesday of, um, of the month in September, October. And uh, it'll be September 23rd mm -hmm. at 11 o'clock, the United Lutheran Church on Cooper Road. Uh, and that's guests at, are always welcome. That's at the corner of Cooper and Forest Hills. So. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm not sure what the program is uh, in September because we're still uh, doing our planning sessions right now mm -hmm. and uh, setting up our, gar our, our uh, gardening year. Mm -hmm. But we always have very good programs and interesting programs, and guests are always welcome. We love to have uh, guests come and join us and mm -hmm. so we can share our information. And then we have a, a design, um, a floral design usually, and yeah. some kind of horticultural exhibit. So it's a lot of information. And thank you, Fran, for joining me today. It's a pleasure. You, you always share such wonderful information. <laughs> so, And that's what gardening is about, is learning and, and sharing and, and uh, you know, just finding out what's new and how, how to do things and how to do things easier. That's, yes. a, that's a great thing. Yes. So, and um, I hope you've enjoyed the program and you will join us next month. And until then, don't forget to stop and smell the roses. <laughs>